Hi and welcome to another episode of Rob's Triathlon Tips for Beginners. This is a video that I've been super pumped to make for a long time, the more I've learned about calories. Um, so I'll try and go through things as thoroughly as possible as to why the caloric system, in other words, calories in, calories out, is a goofy approximation at best. And that's putting it politely. <laughs> <laughs> we continue to use this caloric system because uh, nobody's come up with anything better, basically, that's simple enough for the average person to understand. And people don't understand anything about what's going on inside their bodies either. So that's a huge problem. Um, after only just scratching the surface of human physiology myself, this quote from Thomas Sowell rings really true. It takes considerable knowledge just to realize the extent of your own ignorance on a, on a topic. <laughs> and I've spent a long time learning about human physiology and health and nutrition, and I am learning things weekly still. It's such an incredible topic. It's, there's just so much to learn. Uh, and so I'm going to try to uh, cover it as thoroughly as possible. And a lot of what I say comes from um, videos I've seen uh, from different doctors, people like Dr. Uh, Jason Fung, Dr. Ken Berry, uh, Professor Bart K, as he calls himself on YouTube, who's a very entertaining character who likes to... Uh, pick apart people's videos. Maybe he'll watch my video and make fun of it. <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> uh, so it's not just me making up stuff. I also got a lot of information from papers that I read from studies. I'm not gonna like put those links to those studies in the description. I'm not a doctor. I'm not calling any of this medical advice. Um, <laughs> it's just edutainment is a word that I've heard other people use on uh, other channels. So hopefully you enjoy this. I cover eight different topics and then I have a conclusion at the end. Uh, and if you do, make sure you hit the like button. Thanks. Okay, so what is a calorie? And what do I mean by what is a construct? A calorie is a calculation of heat energy. Okay, It's a construct. A construct is something invented by human beings to try to understand the behavior of something. There isn't a physical thing that you can touch that is a calorie. A calorie is a construct of the amount of heat energy in degrees Celsius, that burning one gram of a food in an instrument called a calorimeter raises the temperature of water. And think about that. What does that have to do with you losing weight? Nothing. <laughs> and weight is technically your mass multiplied by gravity. So weight is a construct. Weight is, is something that's listed in newtons, not kilograms and pounds. So when someone asks you your weight, what they really mean is what is your mass? So I'm going to try and refer to weight, a uh, mass going forward instead of weight all the time. And when people say they want to lose weight, they're, to be specific, they want to lose fat mass. I don't know why people are afraid of saying that, but that's what they mean. And they potentially want to gain some muscle. So what else is a construct? Energy is a construct, believe it or not. You can't really measure energy, per se. All you can do is calculate it as a theoretical thing. Take kinetic energy, for example. It's half of the mass times the square of the, the velocity of something. So you can measure the mass right? My phone, it has mass. You can calculate the velocity of me throwing my phone across the room 
by dividing the distance it traveled by the time it took for it to travel that distance. Then you can calculate kinetic energy. Um, you can measure the time and you can measure the distance, but you cannot measure kinetic energy only calculated. It's a construct. So for that matter, even velocity is a construct. Therefore, acceleration is a construct. Therefore, force is a construct. Struct and work is a construct. <laughs> that should be kind of twisting your mind a little bit. Sort of shining a light on how we've invented so many concepts to try and understand the world. And they may be sort of correct. But they may end up being wrong. That's the beauty of science, is it evolves as we discover that we don't have things right. Uh, and your body does not give a damn what the human concept of energy is. I am going to talk more about energy specifically under problem number eight, thermodynamics. Okay, Heat energy is the kinetic energy of atoms. And that comes from vibration of atoms, of rotation of atoms, and the translation of atoms, meaning their movement, other than vibrating and rotating. And heat is transferred between two bodies by the exchange of photons. Photons have no mass. So heat exchange is not an exchange of mass. So what the hell does heat energy the calorie have to do with you and mass. Nothing. Just in case you're confused about temperature, liquid nitrogen does not have negative heat energy. It has a sub-zero temperature because the temperature at which water freezes was used as a reference point. Only a perfect vacuum would really have no heat energy in it. Uh, regardless, Back to the idea of uh, what a calorimeter does. Your body does not burn food like coal and use that energy to create steam and then use the steam to drive your arms and legs like pistons. Your body is a highly sophisticated machine driven by hormones primarily. You're not a steam engine. Your brain, muscle, skeletal, and fat growth is driven by your hormones and I'll get way into those details a little later in this video so conclusion number one a calorie in the context of a human body is a really bad overly simplistic analog of what is going on in your body Problem number two, why can't you accurately determine calories in, right? People like to talk about how it's just your control of your body composition is just calories in, calories out. Okay, well, let's talk about calories in and why it's impossible for you to accurately know it. Let's pretend that a calorie and the concept that heat energy still means something to a human being for fun. Here are some of the issues with counting calories in. Number one, food companies are legally allowed to be inaccurate by a certain amount on labels of, of processed food, depending on what country you live in. In the US, they're allowed to be as much as 20% off on the amount of calories in a food. Again, I'm assuming calories still mean something. Problem number two, food... <laughs> Fiber is mostly indigestible and not used by your body for energy. Therefore, you don't burn it. Burn it. And it shouldn't count as calories in because you're not using it for energy. <laughs> so when you see that on a label, that's pretty stupid. It's, it's got nothing to do with energy in your body. Number, problem number three, protein, okay? The two main sources of energy for you to do physical work are fat and carbohydrates. And yet 
protein is on food labels as calories. Protein is not used as a primary energy source in the body like fat and glucose specifically. When I say carbs, I mean glucose. Therefore, it should not really be counted as calories in in a one-to-one -one ratio. It's hard to know exactly how many how much energy your body is using from protein in, on a given day versus how much of it is being used for a huge number of things in your body and how much of it is just coming out the other end of you as waste. So like, what are some of the things that protein is used for in your body? Protein is used to repair tissue, build new tissue, help with hormone and enzyme production, maintain your immune system, help with things like balancing the fluid levels throughout your body. The nitrogen in, pro in protein is one of the main components required for protein synthesis and the production of several compounds such as hormones, neurotransmitters, and components of antioxidant defenses. 40% of your bones are protein. And the, like the, that's how much of your bones are made up of protein. It's, it's kind of like the, the structure of your bones. Like imagine the, the structure of a beehive. It's that part, it's not the honey. That's the other stuff in your, that your bones are made up of. And that kind of makes you wonder if telling people to eat less protein as they get older is bad advice, <laughs> right? <laughs> but anyway, only after your body has done everything else it needs to do with the protein that you've eaten is the rest of it used for energy or gone to waste so it's not a primary energy source in your body so don't look at a label and think there's 16 grams of protein in it therefore i'm getting so many calories from that protein that's not accurate um, if you still are determined to count calories you have problem number four, which is your poo. How <laughs> do you think? Why are you talking about your poo? You have to consider that the stuff coming out the other end of you was not used by your body for energy. It's a waste byproduct. So to be accurate counting the number of calories into your body that you actually used to do things, you need to take your poo every time you take go number two and burn that in a calorimeter figure out how many calories are in your poo and then subtract that from the calories that you supposedly got from what you ate so conclusion number two accurately determining the number of calories in is not possible So problem number three with the caloric system is how to measure calories out. We talked about how measuring calories in is accurately, it's just not possible. So let's dig into why calories out is also not possible. And this again is assuming that calories still mean something to a human body, which they don't, but anyway, the concept of human daily energy expenditure is broken into three categories. Uh, number one is your basal metabolic rate. Number two, diet induced thermogenesis. Number three is the energy cost of physical activity. So I'll explain what each of those are. So your basal metabolic rate is the caloric energy your body would use if you were basically in bed all day long, not eating, lying completely still. It's how much energy you're going to burn in a day at rest, not taking in any food. It's the energy needed to keep your organs going. And your basal metabolic rate is impacted by several variables. Um, and here are some of them. Your muscle mass. So the, the more muscle mass you have, the higher your basal metabolic rate will be. That's why people say, don't just try to lose weight by doing cardio. You need to have muscle. The more muscle you have, the more calories you burn. That's why. 
uh, your age will affect it. The older you are, the lower your basal metabolic rate will be. Supposedly your genetics, which is a cop-out for not understanding what else causes things. <laughs> um, the weather, apparently. If it's cold, you'll have a higher basal metabolic rate to maintain your body temperature where it needs to be. If it's extra hot where you are, you'll have a higher basal metabolic rate to cool off your body. You'll sweat. Believe it or not, when you're pregnant, you can have a higher meta basal metabolic rate. Because women need to grow a fetus. Um, menopause can either increase or decrease your basal metabolic rate, depending on your, what's going on with your hormones. Supplements can impact your basal metabolic rate. For example, taking caffeine can do that. Um, and one of the myths that you hear a lot, I'm sure you've heard, is that you should snack, you should eat smaller meals, more meals throughout the day because that increases your metabolism. And there are most studies that have looked into that show that eating frequency has little or no effect on your metabolism. It's complete nonsense. It's this myth that just keeps getting spread by people. Diet-induced thermogenesis is the second thing involved with energy expenditure in your body. And what that is is the amount of caloric energy above your basal metabolic rate based on the food that you eat. So your body will have the toughest time breaking down alcohol, then protein, then carbs, then fat. And the more energy that you need to process and you need more energy according to that hierarchy to process those foods so if you eat a meal that's a mixture of the macronutrient groups how would you know exactly what your diet induced thermogenesis was you can't you can't accurately know it interestingly during a fast you may experience cold hands and feet i get that and your diet induced thermogenesis is like nothing because you're not eating. So your body will theoretically prioritize maintaining your core temperature for your organs. And that's why your extem extremities, your hands and feet, will get cold. Uh, also, the only way to accurately track calories burnt during exercise is to exercise in a lab hooked up to a whole bunch of equipment and like your your fancy smartwatch that says that you burnt so many calories because you went for a walk for half an hour that's just a wild at like an educated guess it, and it's that's all it is your body is completely unique you're gonna have a different diet induced thermogenesis based on what you ate and when you last ate your basal metabolic rate is different than someone else's. So you, this, your watch, it's just a wild guess. So the conclusion number three is you have no way of accurately knowing how many calories your body is burning. Problem number four, not all calories are created equal. I'm still assuming that a calorie means something, which it doesn't. The caloric system is really appealing to companies because that make junk food because they can argue that 100 calories of a soft drink is just calories. And if you exercise, you're going to burn it off. And doctors can also then give you the stupid advice that you can eat anything in moderation. Okay? This is one of the reasons why everybody is sick. But we know that if you eat 1,500 calories of chocolate cake every day, because that's the minimum amount of calories you need to take in a day, supposedly, that very different things are going to happen inside your body than if you ate 1,500 calories of steak every day and nothing else. One of those things will support your health with essential fatty acids, amino acids, vitamins, minerals, 
and help you get or stay lean, and the other will make you fat and destroy your health over time. <laughs> Even just considering that, all calories are not created equal. Assuming that a calorie still means something, which it doesn't. Fats are digested slowly and efficiently by the body over many hours. And they create and and only part of the fat that you eat is converted into glucose by gluconeogenesis. Carbs are digested very quickly and less and less efficiently by the body than fats because of fiber. And they cause a big spike in your blood glucose and insulin. And protein is digested slowly and less efficiently than carbs. And it does cause more of a glucose response in your body. But again, it's not a spike like carbs. It's over time. So if you believe in calories, then you have to un admit that protein would take more energy to digest than carbs. And that not all car calories are created equal. And another big hole in the argument that all calories are created equal is a study, for example, that was done in 2012 by uh, Harvard, and they tested health impacts of various diets while keeping one variable the same, calories. The study examined um, how the quality, not the quantity of calories, might influence weight loss. And even at the same carefully controlled caloric intake, a low-carb diet was calculated to burn 300 calories more in a day than a low-fat diet based on weight loss. So, I mean, there's just a few examples of why a calorie is a calorie is false. And the concept of a calorie in the human body is still rubbish. Problem number five, calories in and calories out are not independent variables. Again, assuming a calorie means something in the context of human beings, if you reduce your calories in, the calories that your body expends does not stay stable. Your basal model, metabolic rate will be reduced by your body if your food intake reduces. You will not lose much fat over time. You have probably experienced this if you've dieted before. Your weight loss plateaus. Your mass loss. So when people stop losing mass, they think, I just need to exercise more and eat less. And then guess what happens? Your basal metabolic rate gets adjusted again by your body. And your body does this to protect your life. And it doesn't want you to starve to death. And people eventually give up after plateauing enough times and their mass increases even more than when they started their diet because their basal metabolic rate is now in the dumps and they go back to their old ways, their bad habits, and they gain all the weight back and then some. And of course, they can be susceptible to blaming their genetics in that case and wrongfully accepting that they will just always be overweight, which is really tragic. It's a lack of understanding of what's going on in your body is what it is. So conclusion number five is trying to change your body composition for the long term based on calories is futile. You're not even playing the right game to lose body mass. Problem number six with the caloric system of body mass control is water. Again, assuming a calorie still means something. What about water? Water doesn't have any calories. If you dehydrate yourself, you will decrease your body mass. Even if you eat the same amount of calories from food from a previous day and supposedly burn the same amount of calories in a day. 
So your body mass loss is not just about calories in, calories out. And yet, to confuse things even more, drinking water supposedly increases your metabolism about 25% for up to an hour after you drink it. So, <laughs> your body is also more than half made up of water. So conclusion number six, calories are still nonsense and keep drinking water. Problem number seven, uh, the topic of hunger. So you don't get hungry because you haven't consumed enough massless heat energy lately. I mean, first of all, <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> Ghrelin and leptin are a couple of the hormones in the body that affect your appetite. Leptin decreases your appetite and ghrelin increases it. And scientists actually thought that making people take a leptin drug was going to be this miracle cure for obesity. But that was a giant flop because your body isn't this overly simplified thing. Right? It's a great example of how you know, medical science can be idiotic. And ghrelin makes you feel hungry in the short term. If you feel hungry between meals, it's because your body releases ghrelin on a regular basis and sort of like pulses. And that feeling of hunger will subside. It will go away within about half an hour. And all you need to do if you fast in between meals, in other words, don't eat, is understand that it's just ghrelin doing its thing every once in a while, making you think you need to eat something, but you do not. Your response should be to drink something that doesn't have any calories. It's that simple. You drink some black coffee, you have some tea that doesn't have any calories, um, you don't add any cream or sugar, you, and you have carbonated water or water. You're not going to die if you don't snack on something. <laughs> Just as important as understanding ghrelin is to consider that the body has satiety hormones for fat and protein that you eat. And there's no such thing for carbohydrates. You can eat things like chips and candy until you feel absolutely disgusting but with fat and protein you reach a point where you feel satisfied where you start to feel like if i eat more of this thing i'm gonna barf try and just try to eat too much salmon for example you can't do it you reach a point where you're done you know you're done and that's not because your stomach is full of of salmon, it's because your satiety hormone is telling you you're good. You don't need any more fat and protein from salmon right now. Right? It's got nothing to do with your stomach being full. Sure, you can eat a whole bunch of pasta until your stomach is full and you feel disgusting. And then I bet you can still find room for dessert. Right? Which is more carbs. <laughs> But that's obviously a pretty terrible choice for your health to do that, to make that decision. Um, when you do that, you're going to spike your blood sugar and your insulin and promote the development of insulin resistance over time and promote fat being stored on your body because insulin is the energy storage hormone. It's what makes you store fat, tissue, and, gly and, and glycogen in your muscles and your liver. It's the energy storage hormone so if you just constantly promote insulin in your body you will get fatter and when your insulin is high you prevent fat tissue from being oxidized your, your stored fat for being used for energy I explain that a little bit more under the next section uh, conclusion number seven hunger has nothing to do with calories and heat energy
Problem number eight, thermodynamics. Uh, this is where things get really scientific. So, I mean, buckle up for some mind-blowing <laughs> information. <laughs> People who want to sound smart when they're talking about calories love to talk about the laws of thermodynamics. They, you know, they can't even quote them or tell you what order they're in. And they really don't know what they're talking about. The laws of thermodynamics apply to closed systems, first of all, okay? Not counting your skin and your eyeballs. You have seven holes in your body. Uh, <laughs> your skin is one giant porous surface, too. So human beings are not even close to being a closed thermodynamic system by any stretch of the imagination. But anyway, the laws of thermodynamics are related to energy, not mass. It's got nothing to do with mass. Uh, what, do you, so what do you need to know really about the laws of thermodynamics? I mean, you can't create or destroy energy. Energy, which we've established already, is a construct. It can only be transformed from one form to another under normal circumstances, like mechanical energy to electrical or vice versa, or electrical energy to heat or mechanical energy to heat through friction, etc. Right? When you eat food, it is mass. Just like energy, mass can't be created or destroyed under normal circumstances, other than like a nuclear bomb, for example. Mass can only be transformed into another form. When you gain weight, you gain mass that comes from an external source, food or water, okay? Most of the mass of the food that you eat comes out the other end of you, or we'd all explode because we'd all be so gigantic. Your body uses what it can from the food that you eat. Vitamins, minerals, collagen, amino acids, fatty acids, glucose, etc., and you get fatter because your body stores the fatty acids in your fat cells. Fat is stored tissue. It's mass. You don't weigh more on a scale because you have more energy in your body. Energy is a massless construct. Sunlight shining on a scale, for example, it doesn't register as mass. Your butt and your stomach get bigger because mass increases. The same goes for glycogen in your muscles and your liver and water retained by your body. It's all mass. So how the hell does your body even work, right? It's way more complicated than I'm about to dive into, but you could really make your head explode getting into these granular details. So I'm not going to go that deep. Uh, the theory of relativity implies that you could theoretically convert mass into pure energy, but that would apparently only be true in extreme circumstances like the Big Bang or if you were near a black hole. So no, you're technically not converting food mass to energy in your body. That's not what's happening. The concept of energy is really a side effect of mass being reconfigured in your body. Most living things break down fat and carbs and proteins into their constituent components with enzymes like amylase, lipase, and protease. And once the food is broken down, the components can be built back up into specific kinds of things that an organism needs like bone, muscle, skin, hair, feathers, fur, etc. So the way that humans attempt to explain that is that uh, breaking down the chemical bonds between atoms and molecules with enzymes causes energy that was holding them together to be released. And that that energy is temporarily captured in the formation of what's called adenosine triphosphate, ATP, in your cells. And ATP is found in all living things. And now that things will get really kind of trippy. 
Facel needs to spend energy to accomplish a task, then the muscle doing work, in the muscle doing the work, the ATP molecule was split off one of its three phosphates becoming ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and a separate phosphate. And the energy that was holding the phosphate molecule to the ADP is now supposedly released and available to do work for the cell. And when the cell has extra energy gained from breaking down the food that you eat, or breaking down glycogen, or breaking down fat tissue, it stores that energy by reattaching that free phosphate to the ADP, turning it back into ATP. And the ATP is like, it's like a rechargeable battery, basically. When it's fully charged, it's ATP. When it's run down, it's ADP. And the battery doesn't get thrown away when it's run down. It just gets charged up again. And that happens constantly in your body. Your body is like this never-ending fireworks show, basically. Uh, and your body is essentially carrying out this sort of like ping pong game, transforming matter to meet its needs. And this sort of dance of energy creates heat energy because atoms are moving. And thankfully, the human body is not a perfect closed system either. So you lose energy through your skin or you'd overheat and you'd die. <laughs> and if you... If you don't eat food, you'll eventually run out of fat tissue and glycogen that can be used to power that ATP, ADP dance. And then your body will start to cannibalize your muscles to survive in the short term, but you'll eventually die. You're not some kind of perfect closed thermodynamic system. That's a perpetual motion machine is the point. Uh, turning glycogen into... Uh, glucose is a process called glycogenolysis and a byproduct of using glycogen for energy to do exercise is lactic acid and when you produce enough lactic acid you reach a what's called the lactic acid threshold that makes it hard for you to keep performing at that same intensity and you can improve your lactic threshold uh, with training to say that carbohydrates are the thing that mainly fuels medium to high intensity activity is not correct. Glycogen does. Let's be specific. Glycogen does. There's a big difference. If you eat no carbohydrates, if you eat a carnivore diet, your body will still make glycogen via a process called gluconeogenesis. And it makes and it makes it from the fat and the protein that you eat. And it is so good at doing it that if you eat no carbs, you will be fine. It's just a crazy idea, but it's true. That's why there's like people who've been eating a carnivore diet for a couple decades now at least. And they're fine. They don't eat any fiber, and they're fine. <laughs> Their health is perfect. Uh, so there's a lot, that's why there's a lot of debate about what diet is correct. It's that people can be healthy on different diets depending on what you call healthy, how you interpret your blood work and your you know, blood pressure, etc. You can also become more fat adapted over months of eating a low carb diet and more capable of using fat tissue for energy instead. And if you eat a really low carb diet, you can use ketones for energy too. If you see a study that says, you know, we studied these athletes and their performance uh, decreased when they went low carb, all of those studies have been short term studies, like one to three months. And so that kind of invalidates them. It doesn't track their performance over a long enough period of time. It takes you time to become adapted to a ketogenic diet and switch your, your energy your primary energy source, right? If that was true, then Dr. Dan Plews, who holds the record for um, age group triathletes in Kona, 
would not hold that record. He's a low carb athlete. <laughs> so how exactly does your body lose mass anyway? You lose mass by all the ways that mass leaves your body via an external boundary, basically. You poo, you pee, you, you sweat, you're, you have snot, you got earwax, nails that you clip, hair that you cut, uh, you have dead skin that flakes off, your breath has stuff in it, carbon dioxide and water, you have tears. It's more useful to think about having a mass imbalance in your diet than an energy imbalance in your diet. To say that you need to control your massless heat energy intake to lose body mass is fundamentally stupid. <laughs> Children don't grow because they have an excess of heat energy. Human growth hormone fuels childhood growth and helps maintain tissue and organs throughout your life. It's mass growth. As you get older, your body slows down hormone production, so you stop growing. And human growth hormone is it's produced by this sort of this pea-sized pituitary gland located at the base of the brain. And bodybuilders are another good thing to touch on. Why do bodybuilders get bigger by taking steroids? Is it because steroids are excess heat energy? No. Steroids are synthetic derivatives of testosterone, which is a hormone, and they stimulate protein synthesis uh, that promotes cell growth, i.e. the absorption of more mass into your body. You add fat tissue to your body because you make dietary choices that raise your insulin. Insulin is a glycogen and fat storage hormone and produced by your pancreas. You block your body's ability to use fat tissue for that ATP, ADP dance when your insulin is elevated. When your insulin is elevated, another hormone called glucagon is low. And what does glucagon do? It helps you break down fat tissue. It's also made by your pancreas. So it should start to click in your mind now that mass control and body composition control is a hormonal problem. The growth hormone, testosterone, insulin, glucagon have nothing to do with the human construct of heat energy called a calorie. Your body is constantly transforming mass and what you eat gives your body instructions on what to do. And when you eat and how often you eat gives your body instructions too. You're telling your body what you want it to do. So you need to understand your hormones and give it the instructions that it needs for you to be your best self. So conclusion number eight is body composition is a hormonal management problem. So we've reached the uh, end of this video, time for a kind of overarching conclusion. Uh, and so let's get into that. Uh, restricting your food intake to meet some nonsensical numerical quota is pretty much an eating disorder. Eating for satiety, on the other hand, and supporting an appropriate hormonal balance in your body is not an eating disorder. To lose body fat, you basically need to follow a lifestyle that enables you to be in a state of net mass loss, not energy loss. And the way to do that is to control your insulin and your glucagon. You do not need to starve yourself for the rest of your life to be healthy. That's idiotic. You have to stop sabotaging your body's hormones and let it optimize itself. I'm going to make a video 
maybe in a few weeks comparing different diets and why they work and don't work and how you can make them work if you want to follow a certain diet. Um, but hopefully you found this video to be thoroughly entertaining and learn a few things. Maybe you still think calories mean something at the end of this, but at least you probably learned a few things that challenge that thinking. Uh, please uh, give this video a like and share it with people who may benefit from it. And make sure you're subscribed, subscribed to my channel. Thanks.